everybody. Welcome to our second episode of Crime Over Cocktails. Today, we are speaking about Dave and Jane Lout. So Dave Lout and Jane Lout were from Oxnard, California. It was a farm town and a beach community. Both families were big into farming. Both fathers were farmers. Dave Lout grew up with his younger brother, Don. Fitness had been ingrained in them by their father for their whole life since they were children. Don even notes that he had his first taste of milk was protein powder. Like that's how much fitness meant to his father. Like they were just Fitness was a priority. It was their life. Is that even, like, okay for children? I don't know. I would think not. But I but I read articles before of, like, some young kids who are, like, decked out in the gym. You know what I mean? Like, for right. fitness parents. So I don't know how old they were, but he says he remembers his first taste of milk with protein powder. Wow. Very, very important to these men. Fitness. Dave, obviously very athletic his whole childhood. He grew up to be an Olympic shot putter. He was nicknamed Superman. He did, like, football, basketball, track and field. Yeah, he was just always doing some type of sport. He just loved it. It was just, like, his outlet. It was so important to him. Yeah, well, it sounds like it was important to the whole family. Oh, yeah. He also won a medal in 1979 for the Pan American Games as top shot putter in the country. Yes, so he was working hard. He finally made it to the Olympics, and in 1984, he won a bronze medal in shot putting he was known to he like made a new move i read in shot putting i forget what they call it but he was like a big up-and-coming shot putter like he was a big deal in the Mm -hmm. olympics oh maybe he created like the spin i think it was some yeah it was something like that it was something that like no one like olympic commentators were like no one ever saw this before and (laughs) so jane she was also very into sports uh she was the top volleyball player she was homecoming queen they became high school sweethearts and you know he was always known as the gentle giant he was six foot three very fit very caring and they just loved each other ever since high school yeah they were both described as like super kind and they just had a connection like everyone described them as just like the perfect couple like the we want to be like you kind of couple every high school has that. right like it's just <laughs> like they were on a pedestal with everyone else and she was described to be like very beautiful she was described as shy but she never put her beauty first like it was never important to her people always commented on how beautiful she was but she just focused more on being like a kind person a good person like family values many described her as gentle as well wonderful fun very loving seemed like they they were a really great couple when they met they had things going for them yeah like you said they began dating they were high school sweethearts always described as very in love and in 1980 they married after that don his brother he was married to a woman named rebecca and rebecca and jane became very very close jane would call her all the time they would hang out rebecca was like you're my family like they were just super close and rebecca always described dave as putting jane on a pedestal like he always spoke highly of jane to them he said wonderful things about jane and they just they all became very close as couples they were brothers and sisters their family so those couples that do everything together yeah it seemed like everything their lives were all just you know hunky-dory dave became the national and world competitor and after winning the bronze medal though his career plummeted it went down the drain that sucks it does suck because you these men and women like they put so much work into this for years Mm -hmm. and years that's like your identity that's all you do it's all you know it's all yeah like you have I mean, he had essentially nothing to fall back on. That's just what he was doing his whole life. Sports, athletics, Olympics. Like, and when you go to the Olympics, you know, you think you're going to, like... You made it. You made it. Yeah, sport, like, endorsements, all this stuff. And then just after that, 1984, it was, like, taken from him. Well, because it was of a knee injury. Yeah, so he had many knee injuries, and he tried many times after he won the Olympics bronze medal to join the Olympic team again. And just in 1988, they were like, no, he never was able to join it again. So, Don... Just Described that feeling that Dave was disappointed, but like he knew his career was done in the Olympics and he 
described it that Dave was okay with it. Like, he knew that door closed, and he was like, that's fine, I'm gonna get a new career. But to me, hearing that, like, I would think you're taking that pretty well. No, like, I mean, anybody who's been to the Olympics or their training, something like that, and something like that happens. Like, you're not gonna be like, it's cool. No. Like, we had a good run. Like, no. I can't imagine him being, like, so... I mean, I don't... I, you know, maybe he was, but... I just can't imagine putting myself in that situation. If I worked my whole life, got to the Olympics, and then because of knee injuries, it was all taken. Like, I would be a bit salty. Well, that's your identity. That's everything to this man. To the family. That's all you know. A hundred percent. I mean, that I kind of, like, raised an eyebrow. I was like, I would think depression would say. Right. Like, something. Like, you would be, like, heartbroken and devastated. Yeah. But supposedly, he was like, all right new career path. So, Dave became a high school biology teacher and an athletic director at the high school, and everyone said that he was just amazing at these jobs. You know what's funny, though, is that saying to those who can't teach? teach? I mean, he could have. I mean, it's a lot, like, it's a lot less pressure, for sure. So, he might have loved that aspect of it, because, like, training every day, your diet, your fitness routine, your whole life. So, he probably, being a teacher and athletic director, he can take a step back, he can breathe. You know, that could have been a nice reprieve for him after all all these years of pressure, but I still feel like he, it seems like he was taking it a bit well. And you would think that's also a blow to your ego. Like, oh. being on the Olympics and winning a bronze medal, like, yeah. you're on cloud nine. But he always remained a legend in his family. His brother always, even after the Olympics, called him Superman. He was the Superman of the family. He was still on a higher pedestal with his friends and family. Maybe that helps soften the blow, too, that everyone still... They know of him. They know his yeah. accomplishments. Yes. So you're still that person. You just, you still can't perform. That's yeah. All. So Dave and Jane struggled, though, to have kids. Like, their lives and careers seemed to be going well, but having a family was very important to Jane. She wanted children. Dave wanted to give her children, but it was never really high on his priority list to have kids. He was just career-driven, focused on the marriage, living his life, but she longed to have children, but they struggled to have them naturally. So in 1999, they adopted a baby boy from South Korea, and they named him Michael. And at that point, they appeared to be a happy and complete family. Picture perfect, white picket fence, perfect family life, and everyone thought everything was going well for them. Until... <laughs> There's always <a> until <laughs> August 28th, 2009, the police received a frantic 911 call from a Jane Louth. Hysterical and distressed. She stated a man was in her backyard and shots were fired. So she had no idea what happened. Dave was outside. The 911 operator was recorded saying for her to not go outside. She needs to stay inside with Michael. Don't wake Michael up. Police are on their way to see what's up outside with Dave. And Dave was already outside. You can't do anything for him, pretty much. So she said Dave told her to go back in the house. And that's when she heard shots fired. So officers were sent to the scene immediately. They were like, this is just, there's no sign of an intruder. There's no sign of a prowler. They found Dave Lout shot multiple times. He was face down on the ground in the backyard. Police were like, this, this doesn't make sense of what you're saying in the 911 call. He had gunshot wounds to his back and the back of his head. So Michael was 10 at this time and Don came over to stay with him while Jane was taken to the police station to be questioned by police. They interviewed Jane. She said she had no idea who could have done this. She thought there was a prowler. They asked her, did you have anything to do with this? She denied, denied, denied. Did not have anything to do with this. Did not know what happened. I was in the house. I was told to go in the house. That was my instruction and I followed it. They were kind of like, that really doesn't make sense. So they wanted her to step by step go through what happened on this day. What led to these events. Jane's initial story was they had a normal evening for the family they were all in bed by 10 p.m. Dave slept in the master bedroom because he had back problems and Jane often slept in Michael's room to not disturb him, which I kind of found weird because if you have back pain, like, do you need a better mattress? Like, but they slept separately. She slept in Michael's room. That's weird. If you have bad back, like, you can still sleep in a bed. You're not sleeping in a twin bed. Get a sleep number, bro. So, I don't know if she just said that and she preferred to sleep by Michael because he was, like, her number one. But back to what she said. At 11 p.m., 
She said, Dave came down the hall from Michael's room worried about their dog. The dog was outside, is what she said. And at 11.15, she and Dave went downstairs to go find the dog in their backyard. I don't know if the dog, he was trying to call the dog in, and the dog wasn't coming, and he was like, where's the dog? But it's in a fenced backyard, so I don't know what all the hullabaloo was about. <laughs> like, she didn't specify, just that Dave was concerned about the dog, needed her to go help find the dog. So they got this red flashlight, took this flashlight to look for the dog. Now, I would like to note in here at this point, while she's being interviewed, I listened to the interview tapes with the police officers. Very, very soft-spoken. She's very timid. She talked very, very quietly. Like, she, it was just odd. Like, she was just so, I don't even know the word to describe it. She was just very timid and very soft-spoken and very, just, just the tone of her voice was just... Is that what you would think when your husband no. was just gunned down? Yeah, it seemed like, it was just odd. Like, she was just very introverted and quiet about it. Like, I even oftentimes with the volume high up, like, had trouble deciphering what she was saying because she was speaking that softly. And obviously, you're going to be scared. You're being interviewed by police. Your husband's just gunned down, like... Right. I'm sure there's a lot of shock. But I don't know. It was just, I, I just remember listening to it and noting that. And like, she said she thought she saw a large shadow near Dave. And the police officers asked her, where were you standing at this time? So she said she was four or five feet behind Dave when he said, quote, get your ass in the house. So she did. She followed instructions. She closed the patio door, left him outside. Then she said she heard three shots. The police asked her to describe those shots, and she said, pop, 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 just like that. Pop, pop, pop. Quick, one oh, after another. One, one, one. One, one, one. Detectives questioned her, saying, are you sure it wasn't pop, hesitation, pop, hesitation, pop? It was one, two, three. And Jane confirmed it was quick pops, and she even went on the counter. She said, pop, pop, pop. Like, she made the noise with her hand. It was quick. They kind of thought that didn't add up. In the meantime, notified of Dave's death. So Don was in shock. Everyone's in shock. This, like, local legend is gunned down. And nobody at this point had suspected Jane outright. So they're just, you know, she's a grieving widow. They're coming to her aid. Um, and a few days later, Dave's friends had a candlelit vigil to honor him in the local community. So, so many people came, people from the school, family, friends, everyone went there to grieve. However, later on, the police noted suspicious behavior from Miss Jane Lau. They said, this is the police's narrative, let's remember. The police were interviewing Jane at the house. They said that she went into the laundry room and tried to keep one officer out of the laundry room, and he noted that she tried to close the door with her inside the laundry room, keeping him out of the laundry room. She didn't want him to go in the laundry room, which I feel like, how do you do that in a police interview? Like, you're trying to close police. Like, that seems a little far-fetched to me. Uh, that's a no-go? That, yeah, like, how do you... They're not gonna allow that. No, right. So, like, <laughs> as a police officer's no, noting no, no, this, no. like, oh, she tried to keep me out of the laundry room, I'm thinking the same thing. Like, you're not gonna be like, oh, she just doesn't want me to go there. Oh, okay, cool, these. Like, why don't you want me in there? Right? No, they so, would be, like, banging on the door, like, yes. ma'am... Come out. First of all, come out. Your husband just died. Why are you locking yourself in a laundry room? Weird. Suspish. Suspicious indeed. Super weird. She was wearing pajamas when they came to the scene. When they arrived, she was in her pajama set. In the laundry room, when supposedly she finally came out, they found her jeans rolled up in a towel with her shirt, and they were between the washer and the dryer. So it looked like they were kind of pushed in there. Was she going in there to shove jeans between the washer and dryer? Just seemed like their their narrative seemed kind of weird to me. Like, I didn't see pictures of the laundry room. They could have been farther apart. Maybe there was, like, a laundry basket in between. I don't know the setup, but normal setups, I feel like they're closer. They also noted that when they began... So when you're involved in a crime with a gunshot, your hands... People at the scene need to be tested for gunshot residue. So when they started getting the gunshot residue test ready, one of the police officers said she went into the bathroom and they stated they didn't know if Jane washed her hands or wiped them on a towel before coming back to the table to have the test administered. Now for me, 
again, suspicious, but also as a police officer, you don't know if she washed her hands or wiped them on a towel. Did you or did you not hear the water turn on? Usually in a case like that, I would imagine either A, you're not allowed to shut the door. Or for the most part, they're going to call, either call in a female officer. Right, to watch. Right. Or you're going to wait to pee Correct. until we do this on your Correct. hand. Correct. Still, I don't know if she washed her hands or wiped her hands on a towel. Like, that seems suspicious. If you didn't see her, like, where are you getting wash your hands or wipe your hand on a towel? Did you hear the faucet go on? Did that you not? you should be able to hear clearly. Right, like, it just seems super, like, holes were missing. Like, you, to me, like, made that up. You either hear the faucet turn on or you don't. And then to describe, oh, she wiped her hands on a towel... Did you see that with your eyes? To me, this whole crime scene was just, hot mess. Oh, God. It wasn't done right. She should have been out of the house. Right. Like, why are you letting her go in and out of rooms, locking herself right. in, washing her hands without administering a gunshot residue test? Like, I feel like they dropped the ball a bit. Uh, a lot of it. Yeah. Usually, they'll take you. Right. Right then, right there, put you in the car, take you to their freaking headquarters, whatever. Do your investigation. Right. That's just crazy to me that they're letting her walk around the house all willy-nilly. Right. Like, yeah, like, the police story is just kind of all over the place, and to me, not really believable on how you should have handled it. Like, it just seems like you're trying to, like... The scene was contaminated. Correct. For the most part. Yeah, it was just not, not good... You didn't do your due diligence, I feel like. No. So, weird. They go on to say, before leaving the home, right, the lead detective was taking a peek around the house and something spoke to him to look in this beautiful grandfather clock they have. When I read the story and I know about the grandfather clock, I was just like, holy crap. I mean, they really do go yeah. into every nook and cranny. Oh, yeah, you and have to. So, in the grandfather clock, he opened it and found the gun. Well, I'm sure they were like, is this the murder? Because who keeps a gun in your right. clock? But then this <laughs> further went to the narrative that Jane's story to them didn't add up. Because if you're an intruder, a prowler outside, you shoot Dave outside. How did you get in the house and put this gun in a grandfather clock, unseen, get out of the house and walk away? My thing is, for all the crime shows that I've watched and we all know, that's a lot. Nobody attacks you in the backyard. You're in the front no. yard. Their instincts were initially like, clearly Jane either did it or had something to do with it. Needless to say, the intruder theory, the prowler theory, thrown out the window. They shifted their focus 100% to Jane. The clothes in the laundry room tested it for gunshot residue. The jeans, the folded up jeans, the towel, the shirt. They did find gunshot residue. They didn't specify how much at the time, though. They just said it was found. They wondered if Jane was in her plain clothes, lured him outside, shot him, came inside, rolled these up, hid them, changed into your pajamas, then made your 911 call. Right. Then they remembered Jane mentioned this red flashlight from the initial interview. Police bagged the flashlight, also tested positive for gunshot residue. So police had assumed at this point that she was holding the flashlight near or over the gun it's just hard for pow 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 with a revolver which we will get to that with the trial yes suspicious again furthermore with the investigators theory and storyline they found that dave was shot a total of six times so they said shot one was fired from several feet away which would make sense because jane even said she was four or five feet away from dave when they went outside this shot grazed his head and they said pieces of scalp deposits were found on the garbage can the bullet eventually hit the wall near where he was standing and this shot, they said, brought him to his knee. Shots two and three were at close range to his face. One was through his cheekbone. They said that it went down the side of the yard, nicks the fence, and they found this bullet on the sidewalk. Shots four, five, and six hit him in the upper arm, back, and the back of Dave's head. The final shot, number six, was to the back of his head. That was the kill shot. They found the bullets that killed Dave outside, and it did match with the gun found in the grandfather clock. So they now knew 100% without any uncertainty this was the murder Battle weapon. Battle the ballistics test. Yes. Ballistics were everything. Mm -hmm. So everything matched. The family found out at this point that they're interested in Jane. So now at this point, Don and Rebecca, so Dave's brother and sister-in-law, now they're going back and saying, you know what? Um, 
I'm thinking back, certain times, like, Jane says suspicious things. She might not have been, like, the Susie homemaker we all thought, which, you know, okay. Like, I know when people die, you're going to look back at certain things, especially if the wife is on suspicion of your brother, brother-in-law's murder. I get that. But I feel like you kind of flipped the script a little bit. Like, you had nothing but shining words to say about them as a couple. And Jane, I loved her like a sister, blah, blah, blah. And now you're like, you know what? No, she could have totally killed him. Right, but I don't you know. know how common that is? That's like all the time. People are not always who you think they are. I think they probably didn't make that decision until they heard more of the facts. I mean, well, I don't know. Like, Rebecca said initially, she's like, some stories didn't add up. So, okay, so this is where it kind of gets weird of, like, suspicions on Jane. And her stories in the past. So Rebecca said that she had some stories of things that happened to her that didn't add up. And at the time, she kind of dismissed it. She was like, you know, whatever. You're like my sister. Weird. But we're going to overlook it, right? So these stories that she remembered. She said Jane told her that two men put a knife to her throat and demanded money. Broad daylight. Like, by her car. Rebecca asked her if she yelled. Did you call the police? Did you make a report? Like, what happened? And Jane just said, no, I just came home. So, Weird. people have a knife to your throat. They're asking for things. Yes. You give them nothing. And give them like, nothing. And they're like, cool, gotta go. Cool, thanks Thanks for trying. I'm gonna try another pod. <laughs> like, you're good to go home. Uh, no. 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 So, she's like, clearly Jane has a history of lying. So, another claim that Jane said to Rebecca was that she would find threatening notes on her car. So when she would tell Don and Rebecca this, they were like, what kind of notes? What did they say? Were they handwritten? What did What are the details? Right. Did you keep them? Did you file a report? Did you call police? Who did you tell? And she kind of just like brushed it off and like changed the subject. Like she wouldn't ever go into detail about said notes. Did they exist? First of all, if they did again, like you said, did you keep them? What happened to them? Did you just say, oh, this is threatening and I'm going to throw it away? Like, me as a female, I would be terrified if I got threatening notes on my but car. But I would keep them. Could keep them. I would file a report. I would take pictures of them. Right. I Contact would. police. Yeah. She just kind of was like, matter of fact, like, I found these. And when she was questioned, she was just like, meh, fish posh. Nothing really detailed. So now Rebecca is starting to think, what's, what's Jane's deal? Like, it's just kind of odd. Don said he always felt that the family dynamic seemed off. Don stated, quote, it seemed like Jane was the parent, Michael was the child, and Dave was in the way, end quote. So Don and Rebecca, looking back, felt like Jane was pushing Dave away, and that put a lot of stress on their marriage, as naturally it would. You're together 20-something years, and now Dave doesn't feel like a priority, he feels like she's being distant. So their marriage was very stressed at this time. So Jane called Rebecca often to vent about Dave or about things that she didn't like about Dave or what he was doing. So I guess she had a lot of issues with Dave that Rebecca's now remembering. Yeah, but these stories that she's coming up with, if you ask me, to me, she's setting up an alibi. Oh, people are leaving notes on my car. Oh, people are following me. Oh, and they must have been the one that broke into my backyard. And <laughs> You know what, though? What? I feel like when we get into later on into her actual real story, I have a theory about these weird stories. Oh, cannot wait to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> In February 2010, Jane was arrested and she was charged with first-degree murder because police felt they had all the evidence they needed against her to charge her and get her a conviction. Police felt that Jane executed him from the jump, that she lured him outside, executed him, then went to hide the evidence, lie about the story, and hid the gun. So police are like, she's, she's our woman from the jump. Like, they just... Correct. Had this whole story. So she hired a defense attorney to help her with the case. When her friends started being interviewed, they thought back in detail about their relationship. So a neighbor from across the street was interviewed, and she felt that Jane was very, very controlled by Dave. She remembers oftentimes she would see Jane outside pulling weeds, cleaning the gutters, doing all the grunt work, washing Dave's truck, and Dave did nothing to help her. He would just stand there and watch her. Wouldn't ever lift a finger. She was like, that's kind of weird that you're having her do all this stuff when you're literally outside. It's not like you're at home, you're working or whatever. You're standing there watching her almost like it was like a punishment. And she noted that her behavior was nervous and described her as, quote, a scared little rabbit. 
So then a close friend of hers also said she was worried about what was actually going down in the loud house. And she also described her as another type of animal and, quote, described her as a scared cat. And she said that she was constantly looking around. She was constantly looking over her shoulder like if someone was behind her, like she was just very jumpy. So a former co-worker of Jane's said that Dave was very aggressive towards her and very demanding. And she was quoted in saying, when he said jump, she would go how high, end quote. So just whatever Dave wanted, Dave got, Dave got, Jane would do, no questions asked. This co-worker also said, she also noticed that Jane always wore long sleeves. Now, they're in California, remember, so it could get pretty hot. Oh, yeah. Wore long sleeves always, no matter what the temperature, her arms were always covered up. She said sometimes, and multiple co-workers of Jane said they noticed this too, sometimes she would have bruises on her face, her arms, her legs, and Jane would never comment on them. I mean, I bruise easily, you bruise easily, but I don't bruise on my face. Right. You know what I mean? Like... Bruises on your legs, your arms, sure, like, I'll run into, like, the side of a cabinet, whatever, and I'll bruise. But the face ones, and they notice facial swelling a lot, too. So it might not have been bruised, but her face was swollen a lot. So Jane's defense attorney said that for 30 years, Dave subjected Jane to abuse. He wanted power over her, he wanted to control her, and he subjected her to all forms of abuse. So verbal abuse, he, would, he called her names. He put her down. He did that to her. Emotional abuse with how he treats her. Going back to what the neighbor saw. You're going to go outside in the heat. Pull weeds. Do the gutters. I'm going to sit here and watch you. That's so intimidating. So intimidating. And remember, he's 6'3". He's a big dude. He's an athletic dude. Jane's described to be, like, very petite. She was athletic, but she's petite. Yeah, that's intimidating. That's weird. Like, yeah, it seemed like something was off there. And also physical abuse. She said he punched her. He kicked her. Slapped her. Uh, pulled her hair, spit on her. She was subject to all of these forms of abuse for 30 years of this woman's life. So that does something to you mentally. Right. For sure. The attorney stated that Michael, he might not have been subjected to the abuse, like physically, but that Dave verbally abused him. And they said that that was because Michael was not athletic at all. Like he was more book smart. Like he wasn't really interested in athletics he like you know things like chess and like reading and you know things like that which great like if my 10 year old was into that stuff i'd be like sweet right you smart stuff right things that you want them to right because remember athleticism was ingrained in him and his brother since childhood so seeing michael have no interest in anything athletic he was just disappointed so he was very very salty about that (laughs) very salty and neighbors even Stated that often they would hear him say racial slurs at Michael. Um, not going to obviously say what they were. Use your imagination. But they saw him yelling at him in the street about how he couldn't ride a bike. Or he wasn't learning fast enough to ride a bike. And that he can't catch a football. He can't play baseball. He, it's just things like that that neighbors notice that like you're, you're not treating your son well. So he never, no one ever said he laid a hand on him. But clearly... To a child, you're you're not being nice to him mentally, emotionally. It might not be physical abuse, but that's mental, mental, and emotional. emotional. Yeah, exactly. So her attorney stated that she covered up his abuse and injuries in fear of what she would do to the people that Jane loved, including including Michael. So she was afraid of what he would do eventually if she didn't cover for him on all these things. So she kind of kept quiet about everything. They did say I did read though, which this also. Tell me your thoughts on this. Oh, you know I will. In the 1980s sometime, so Jane made a police report stating an intruder attacked her while she was alone at her job. So police did find injuries on her, bruising to be consistent with her story, but they they never found an intruder, obviously no cameras. So her attorney said that at this time, Dave inflicted those injuries on her. Jane wanted to make a police report. He's saying that, Dave forced Jane to lie and cover it up and come up with this intruder story. So she, to me, you're being conditioned, right? To cover up, potentially, your husband's abuse. Right. But who breaks into their wife's work to... Well, then he might not have broken in. She might have made a police report, and then when they interviewed her, she was like, oh, someone broke in. So her attorney is saying she wanted to report this as, like, an abuse, but between that time... 
he got to her after she made that phone call and was interviewed and was like, no, cover it up. This was an intruder at your work. This is how you got these bruising. So who knows? Was it an intruder? Was it Dave? So this was before Michael. Before Michael. This was early in their marriage. See, now that part, that part I really don't know what to do with. It doesn't make sense. But it's just food for thought. Fast forwarding from June 2009 to August 2009, her attorney saying that's when the abuse really, really escalated with Dave and Jane. And on August 28th, 2009, something changed in Jane. So supposedly she had been dealing with this abuse for 30 years. And on that night that he was shot, something finally triggered her to take action. She snapped. So Jane told her attorney that Dave threatened Michael's life on this day. And she believed that Dave was going to kill her son. That's what lit this whole thing up in flames. So he's like, I'm going to kill Michael. And she's like, the hell you are. I can see that. I I can see that as well. Yes. But the man is walking away from you in the backyard. He's not hurting anybody at that time. But you're scared. You're abused for 30 years. You're scared of this man. You're protecting your baby. I get that. He was facing the other way. Yes, that, okay, that I will be, I'll be honest. I feel like I can't obviously explain off why a man was found face down with shots in your back in the back of your head. Because clearly, you're not facing her, like you said, if it's in your back. You're You're not turning away. You're not going at Michael. So Jane's story, though, Jane finally tells the truth to her turn. Jane says that she took Michael to the beach this day on August 28th, 2009. And they were home late, and he was pissed off, screaming, yelling. He was saying things like, nobody respects me, nobody cares about me. Jane, knowing he does this behavior at times, put Michael to bed, took care of Michael. She changed in her, into her pajamas, she says, and waited for Dave to calm down. She was kind of hiding out in Michael's room, like she often does. And he did not calm down. Dave was stewing around the house, stewing in their bedroom, and around 10, 30, or 11... Jane said Dave came out of the bedroom and Jane saw that he was holding the gun. He had the gun in his hand. So Dave continued to talk about Michael, saying that they both don't respect him. And he was also just being erratic. He's coming at her. She's near Michael's room. So she runs downstairs. And at this time downstairs, Jane was thrown against a wall by Dave. And at this point, she, you know, you're thrown against a wall. You you kind of sink down to the floor. So she does like a backwards crab walk she said, to the back door. And that's when she goes out on the patio. And naturally, he followed her out. She was trying to get him out to de-escalate. She's backwards crab walking, being like, calm down, calm down. Like, what are you doing? Like, this, relax. And this is at the point where outside, she said Dave tripped. She tried to grab the gun. They struggle. And Jane eventually gets the gun. And that's when she said that she emptied it in him. This is when she runs back in the house, places the gun in the grandfather clock calls 911. Her attorney is saying at this point she doesn't know he's dead. Like she just knows that he's down, he's on the ground. She doesn't know if she hit him how many times. She has no idea. She in her head is thinking that he's going to get up and attack her and Michael. And her attorney states that she lied about the story because like I said earlier, this was a conditioned response to cover for Dave. You know, he's dead and she's still like covering for Dave's abusive behavior by saying, no, actually, there was an intruder. The intruder shot him. Her attorney stating that when police discovered that she lied about the intruder, that this is at the point where they made up their mind about Jane right there and that they're going to form a narrative and form, not form the evidence, but form the stories about the evidence around their narrative of like, she did this from a malicious intent. I mean, anytime a story changes like that you kind of have to you know what I mean but you also have to like hear her side though I mean I get she wasn't saying her side at the beginning but I'm sorry if that's legit and I'm saving my child and I'm doing all that that will be my first story out of my mouth 30 years of abuse and conditioning to cover him and his abuse like At that point, you have no self-esteem. You're not yourself. You're just trying to please this man to not get your ass beat. You know what I mean? Like, I I don't know. I just see so many holes in this. So he's threatening the kid, but now you're in the backyard. She wants to take him away from the room. If he's coming to the room with a gun, if someone's coming to your son's room with a gun, you're not going to stay there with Michael. You're going to distract and get them far the hell away from your kid. 
I mean, she was terrified. She was just thinking that that's the best option to try to get him away from Michael. You think she's innocent? You oh, think, well, you think it's no? I defense. right? I don't. Clearly, you shot him. I do not. I think yes. this was calculated. And she also found out he was researching divorce several weeks before. You know, I don't know. You can't get in the mindset of these people. Everyone reacts to the abuses differently, you know? Oh, absolutely. Like, I don't think, personally, I know you do. I don't think, personally, that's what it was for her. I don't think that. And, like, even, like, okay, so the testing was weird. Which, this is where it gets suspect for me with the police story. Because after getting details about the testing, so they did find, like we said earlier, the jeans and the shirt rolled up in the towel suspiciously in the laundry room did have gunshot residue but they never said how much right so her attorney found out that they didn't even test her pajamas and that's what she was found in when they came to the house she was in her pajamas when he read the police report and the gunshot residue test on the clothes that was found in the laundry room was like trace amounts of gunshot residue so if you murdered somebody and shot your gun six times, you're going to have more than trace amounts on your clothes, period. So he decided to test the pajamas covered in gunshot residue. That does support her story that she's sleeping. He came, whatever happened outside, and pop, pop, pop. That's a big piece to be wrong on with the clothes. As the police said that Jane was getting up to wash her hands and or wipe her hands on a towel in the bathroom, the attorney said that never happened and that the police were covering up a major mistake. They lost the gunshot residue sample test that they did on her hands. Stop it. Lost it. Couldn't find it. They don't have the sample. They don't have the results. They lost the freaking sample. So he's saying they made it up to cover their asses. But if it's on your clothes, you know it had to be on your hands. Correct, but it's not a question of if it's on her hands or not. It's a question of which clothes it was found on and why. Because if the gunshot residue was found 100% covered on the clothes in the laundry room, then that supports their theory of she did it with those clothes on, hid the clothes, washed her hands, changed her clothes, called 911. Meaning she probably never even went to bed. All right. That whole story. Right. Her just... whole story's nixed. But right. if it's found on her hands in the pajamas, which they never cared to test, that supports her self-defense theory that we got home, we changed, he was in a pissy-ass mood, I went to sleep with my son, I tried to get him the hell out of Dodge, I'm in my pajamas shooting my husband. Self-defense. So the attorney's saying... You know, either way that happened, like, the police's narrative is clearly you're shooting major holes in it. Like, you're losing right. evidence. But don't forget, the Ruger is hard to fire. You literally have to cock it back each time you fire it. Right. In the trial, the prosecutor did bring up that point. And he had said that, you know, it's not an easy gun to shoot. It's not just like, like she said. Yeah, it's not just a pop, 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 like she described. You do have to pull back to fire the gun. However, her attorney did say it is possible to fire it if you hold back the hammer and pop, 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 you pull the trigger down. That is a method called fanning. So you can do it either way. So which way did she shoot it? She could hold back the hammer and pop, 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 shoot Dave. Or in the prosecutor saying, that's probably not plausible because you have to pull back the hammer, shoot, pull back the hammer, shoot, which that's why the police had asked her, was it pop hesitation, pop hesitation, pop hesitation, because that matters right. how you shot the gun. So both sides had valid facts on how she could have shot the gun. What I would do personally is I would see, does she go to a gun range? Do they have something outside? Right, which they never, I, I mean, I don't know if she did, but I never saw anything like she was an avid shooter. That's something you but see But you're also Western. at close range, though, at that point. One shot was fired from five feet away, he was knocked down, and then she, like, kept going. Which, if you're scared, you're gonna keep going. You're not just gonna graze a pinky and be like, alright, we're straight, you, you calm now, Dave? Like, Do you have to empty all six rounds? I feel like if you're terrified, yeah, you do! After the bullet trajectory, though, her attorney says that, like, he interviewed many uh, experts on this. And how the police stated that the bullet went into Dave's head, that first bullet that grazed his head, was at a 90-degree angle and hit the wall and deposited the scalp matter on the garbage cans, 
all these experts say that it's not physically possible to do it. The expert was saying that it, quote, violated the law of physics. And Dave's DNA was found on the trigger of the gun also. So that proves that there was a struggle. Dave did handle the gun. So that further supports her theory that he was going to Michael's room holding the gun. His DNA is on the gun. You can't fake that. Going Unless it's his struggle. gun and he's used to being the one that shoots it. Maybe he does target practice. I don't know. I would think if that was his new sport, somebody in the interviews would have said, yeah, Dave loves shooting a gun. You know what I'm saying? Like, it just seems No, I mean, like, I get that. It just seems weird. His his hand, his fingerprints, his DNA was on the trigger. Like, you're actively walking around the house. I don't know. A lot of questions. Y'all, listeners, <laughs> I'm super passionate about certain stories that we're going to say. This one is my one. I'm going to try to change Tiffany's mind because I don't believe that it was not in self-defense. So, the morning after Dave was killed, photos of Jane showed bruising on her upper left arm in the shape of a handprint, which further supports her self-defense theory because remember that she had said she was thrown up against a wall, then knocked down and crab walked backwards to the patio to get him outside. So let's introduce Helen. She's Jane's close friend from childhood. She's a social worker. So she's interviewed. And she's saying, you know, as a childhood best friend, we're really close. We used to write Christmas cards to each other. But over the years, she started responding less and less. Jane did. You know, at the time, Helen never heard back. Like, never, ever heard back. She would be like, hey, Jane, let's set up a phone call. After looking back on this, and she said that after she heard of Dave's murder, light bulb switched in her mind. And she was like, you're a battered wife, and nobody, including me, who's trained, saw it. Like, she was so good at covering everything up. She had all the signs, the bruising, the not talking about things, the Becoming isolation. Yeah. Isolation. He was isolating her. She didn't want to talk to people. Like, nobody saw it. Dave's family, though, adamant about not abusing Jane. So Don said, and quote, I know my brother, and man, he give you the shirt off his back. That's just the way he was. When asked if... He saw Dave losing his temper to Jane or abusing her. He vehemently denied it. Never. Dave would never. He was the most gentle person. Now, back to your story about motives, right? Don and Rebecca feel that Jane had that financial motive to kill Dave. Combing through the financial statements of the Louts, police did find that they mm -hmm. were struggling financially. They were living beyond and above their means for years. For years, they had poor money management. So I get that. After Dave died, um, this is when Don and Rebecca found out that Jane would ask Dave's parents for money, thousands and thousands of dollars. Sixty thousand. Sixty thousand dollars she borrowed, and for what? They said to pay their mortgage, to pay doctor bills. Yeah, to but pay they don't think supplies, Dave tuition. even knew that she asked for that money. But also, here's my theory on that: if you're in an abusive relationship, right? You're scared of your husband. You're scared. You're tiptoeing around. She might not have told him, hey, we're like not living within our means. Like we can't do X, Y, Z. We can't afford it. So she might have hid that from him. Well, that's where they need to go a little further in and see right. when she got the money, what did she do with it? Right. Did she paid. Did she pay? Right. They also found out that Dave had not one, not two, but three life insurance policies on him. Which I feel like is That's a bit much. A bit much. Three hundred thousand. Like, it was well, the police said three hundred to three hundred fifty thousand. So it was a huge chunk of money. I mean, if you're in debt, one could say that would be enough to murder over. And Jane was the primary and only sole beneficiary on all three. So they the police were saying if it were an intruder and a prowler, no questions asked, that three hundred, three hundred fifty K is going right to her. However, she never asked for the money. She never claimed it. She never filed for it. She never saw a penny of his life insurance. So if that was your motive and you killed someone, I get that's like suspicious to like go collect on it, but she never touched it. Money wasn't a priority that for her. That part baffles me. Yeah. The fact yes. that she didn't try to collect on it, but I think she might have been waiting until all the smoke cleared. But it was like year, like four years past that she was free on bond and she didn't do shit. And like even Rebecca said that but they put a hold on it. If you're wanted for murder, you can't True. touch it if you wanted to. True. But also, like, even Rebecca said that Jane would say, I'd be better off if Dave wasn't around. Which I get both sides of why that sounds suspicious. Because if you wanted to murder your husband and you're pissed, and you're like, yeah, I'd be better if he wasn't around. Or, on the flip side, in support of Jane, 
if you're being abused for 30 years, you would be better if he wasn't around. Maybe not murdered, right. but if you weren't with him. I feel like something she said was taken out of context. Could be. And then also going back to the story she told Rebecca and Don, those could have been cries for help. You know, someone held a knife against my throat. Maybe it, it was her like, reflecting. It was... Right. Like it could have been him doing it, but And she, she's trying yeah. to speak out. I don't feel like she's a scorned woman. I feel like it really was defense. And, like, four years passed. Like I said, she's free on bond. So Dave's family, hit fuming his brother, his sister-in-law, nieces, and his nephews. Two of his nephews were even interviewed. And they were, like, you know, honoring our uncle. Like, we just take it out at the gym. Like, we knock it out at the gym. That's, like, our... Again, fitness is big in this family. So everyone's pissed that nothing's done. And Jane is just, like living her life. There's no trial. There's nothing. Four years after his murder. So in September 2013, Don, Dave's brother, went in front of a judge and he pleaded to get the case in the front of the jury. He's like, we're still here. We can't move on. So he pleaded to a judge, get this case to trial. Over five years passed after Dave died at this point in January 2015. Finally, prosecutor reaches out to make a plea deal. And it is the deal of a lifetime. Of a fucking lifetime. Like, literally... Best case scenario for a deal one could ever be offered. Prosecutors offered Jane to plead guilty to voluntary manslaughter, and she would get sentenced to six years, but most likely would only serve half. That is nothing. Her attorney naturally was like, I strongly, strongly recommend that you take the deal. And Jane refused. She was quoted in saying, I have to fight for this. But you still did it. For self-defense. I, I, but what is three years for taking a life? I, I get that. But, like, okay, but Helen, remember Helen, our social worker friend? She said that after that night, Jane felt empowered again. Like, she's finally out. She felt empowered. She felt like she was protecting her son. She's like, mama bear. And, like, her light was no longer dim anymore. All of her friends and family and Jane were, like, very adamant. Like, they're not going to find me guilty. They're going to hear my story. They're going to hear the truth. And they're going to side with me and they're going to see all these holes that the police did. They're going to see the botched investigation. They're going to see all this stuff. We're going to bring in experts and it's... Did she go on the stand in her own defense? She did because you have to. I, you do have to take the stand in your defense to, I guess, I forget what the attorney said, but yeah, she did take well, the stand. Well, people who don't, you just look guilty. I mean, yeah. I understand, obviously, you're going to be under scrutiny on both halves. and so Right. And she wanted to. She wanted to tell her story. So finally, six years after Dave's death and murder... In January 2016, the trial finally started. The prosecutor obviously pled that Jane was calculated in executing Dave, and Jane's attorney pleaded that she was an abused woman for over three decades, which one's the truth. So, Jane did take the stand. She told her story, told it very, very eloquently, told facts, told all the stuff, told the story of being late from the beach. So, the jury heard everything both sides. And her attorney stated, quote, I think she could live with the fact that he could kill her. She could not live with the fact that he would kill Michael. That's a strong statement. It's a strong statement because I, I get that. Like, I could deal with whatever you want to throw at me, but, like, you bring my kid into it, that's a different story. Oh, it's game over. It's game over. A hundred percent. So that was one quote that was, like, so strong with me. Like, I get that. She admitted on the stand even when she was pleading to the jury, she was like, yeah, I did lie on the 911 call. I did lie about my initial story, but like I was scared and she denied any financial motive. And she even said like, I didn't ask for the money. I didn't receive any money from life insurance. It was noted in the trial that on cross-examination, when prosecutors were asking questions, she would often say like, I don't remember. I don't recall. But also on that note, like it is six years after, you know, right. I'm trying to forget that. Like, I mean, I can't even remember what I had for dinner last Wednesday. Like, you're asking me to recall a night. I get it's like a, a traumatic night, but at the same time, like, it was years and years ago. And some people even block out the traumatic Yeah, events. exactly. And if you're abused for 30 years and that happens, you could draw a blank on that. That, I think, is plausible of not recalling. I don't think that's, like, trying to hide anything like the prosecutor tried to make it seem. Right. Like, I think she could have just been, like you said, like, blocking it out. I don't know. There's just so much. So the jury deliberated for three and a half days, and they finally came to a decision. And the decision, I would like to say, I do not agree with. I don't know where you're at with all the facts of each side. I don't agree with the decision at all. 
The verdict was Jane Lott was found guilty of first degree murder, and it was noted that her defense attorney looked so distraught, hung his head down. He was so sure that people would they like were believe her. her. Yeah, and he was just like defeated, and it was noted that she comforted him in the courtroom. Oh, wow. She like put her hand on his back on his shoulder and was like, it's okay. So that even goes to play. You're like this kind of person. You're not this, like, you literally just got convicted of murder, first degree murder, and you're comforting your attorney. So now Jane faces the possibility of life in prison. I don't know. It Honestly, I think what sealed her fate was he was walking away from her. I understand if you're wanting to protect your son, first you lied about the whole scenario. Right. And then you did it while the man is walking away. I mean, police... They don't always get it right. No. Let, let's be honest. Yeah. They don't. They don't always get it right. And innocent people go to prison. All the time. All the time. All the time. So that's Jane. Yeah. That's Jane Lout. And we are just... I don't know. Conflicting viewpoints. Tiffany doesn't know. I get how she couldn't know, but I feel like I feel like it was self defense. So we'll just end it here. But make sure to follow us on our Patreon page at Crime Over Cocktails if you want to get access to exclusive Crime Over Cocktails goodies. Make sure to listen to us on Apple Podcasts. Give us that five star review and make sure to comment on our Instagram page. We are posting audio on YouTube, so make sure to go like, subscribe, leave comments. Give us some feedback, guys. Like, what do you think? What do you think of the case? What do you think of the show? Is there a case that you want us to do? Something that interests you that we can comment about? Anything. We are here to chat for you guys. Absolutely. We are so thankful you guys came. All the support so far has been amazing. Absolutely. We are just so grateful for all of you. Can't wait to talk again. So we will talk crime another time.